morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. 
It's good to be in the Lord's house, being with the Lord's people, and great to see you here this morning. Great to see visitors with us today. We hope you feel welcome. Uh, just wanted to uh, go to the Lord before we before we begin. We got a big day. Big. Uh, we got our, our uh, lunch with our senior saints today. We have our senior Sunday tonight. We get to acknowledge them. So we have lots of wonderful things today. And uh, let's just go to the Lord and ask for His blessing. Father, we thank you that this is the day that you have made. This is the Lord's day. And Lord, this is the day that we get to worship you with our brothers and sisters in Christ, which is a foretaste of heaven. And God, we just want to delight ourselves in you, Lord. God, we thank you for all your privileges and blessings that we do not deserve, but Lord, that you grant them freely to the beloved. Father, we pray that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that you would help us to, uh, Lord, to these words that we sing, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, uh, Lord, grip our hearts with each word, God, each truth, each principle. And Father, would you just encourage us today? Father, would you correct any false beliefs, any false ways? Father, that you would search our hearts. And Lord, would you just remind us of the wonderful, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Lord, help us to be reminded of, of why he came and what he accomplished. And God, what our future entails because of his great work on the cross. And Father, we pray that you would just be exalted today. God, your name would be lifted up high way higher than ours, and Father, that you would just give us a heart of praise and adoration, Lord, that we would love you and serve you and trust you. Father, would you be honored in our midst today, and God, would you uh, call all folks in this room to yourself today, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. Uh, I should say, as we left last week, Danny uh, finished up his sermon with a reminder of the victory that we have in Christ. To, to reign in this life is to know God and to, to know Christ as, as Lord and Savior. And there's, in Christ, we have victory. We have hope. Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 20, verse 4, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for, for you against your enemies to give you the victory. In Christ, we have everything we need uh, for, for salvation. He has, he has saved us. He fights for us. He has secured the victory, not in our own doing, but in his power and his might. He has achieved the victory. So if you'd please stand with us as we sing Christ Victorious. Come on, people. Come all people, bow before him, lift your voice for his renown. Christ has stormed the gates of evil, bound the captor, claim the crown. Sing the praise of Christ exalted to the Son, your tribute bring. Join the chorus, Christ victorious, honor to the King of Kings. See behind Him, all is faithful. See behind Him, all is faithful. With the weak, He shames the strong. This is us, all the weary, wounded sin. His banner they belong. Come, you strangers, find your refuge from the foe and enemy. He makes wonders more than conquerors, people of the King of Kings. That's right. When the battle rages around us, when the battle rages round me, when I'm failing in the fight, I will call on him who found me. He is ever on my side. We shall stand, we shall stand against the darkness, armed in Christ, our strength and plea. Hell itself shall quake before him. We are his, the king of kings. Praise the Lord. And now we march. Now we march with him to glory. For his name we air 
press on into death. He's gone before us. Hear, O grave, his victory song is the throne and is the kingdom, is the place shall ever be. Join the chorus, Christ victorious, glory to the King of kings. Is the throne, is the throne, and is the kingdom, is the praise shall ever be. Join the chorus, Christ victorious, glory to the Uh, this next song we're going to sing today is a, is a new song for us, uh, My Soul Will Wait, based off of Psalm 62. I think it's fitting that we sing this song this week, uh, following Christ victorious, because the verse opens with, when the enemy surrounds and my heart grows faint within, when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in, I will trust in you, O Lord, in the silence I will wait. I will stand upon your word, for you are my rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait. My soul will wait for you. Christ is victorious, and in him we share in that victory, but we must realize and remember that we operate in his strength, not our own. We wait for his leading. We don't take charge. So I hope this song is, is a blessing to you. My soul will wait. surrounds when the enemy surrounds and my heart grows vain within when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in I will trust in you O Lord in the silence I will stand upon your word. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You're my stronghold and my shield in the midst of every threat. Though the wicked never yield, they will vanish like a breath. We know, yes, I know the outcome sure. Satan's evil plans will fail. In your power, I'm secure. He's our solid rock. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait. My soul will wait for you. You're my comfort. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken, my refuge and my sure foundation. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. This is love. This is love I can't explain. This is mercy unreserved. Through your sacrifice so great, I have peace that sun deserved, for the battle has been won, and I fear no shame or loss. Now the sting of death is gone. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken, my refuge and my sure foundation. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. 
pouring out our hearts. our perfect Savior. Perfect Savior, strong defender, we will trust in you. Pouring out. Pouring out our hearts before you. trust in you. Perfect Savior. Perfect Savior, strong defender, we will trust in you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I love how that song ends, pouring out our hearts before you. We will trust in you. Why? Because he's our perfect savior. He's our strong defender. We will trust in you. Uh, It's one thing to to celebrate the victory they have in Christ, but the application of that, what does that mean for my daily life? I have victory in Christ. It means that you and I, if you be in Christ, have total victory peace and assurance through all circumstances. There is not one thing that happens to you or I in this life, good or bad, that will separate us from the love of Christ. He has fought for us. He has, he has achieved victory totally where you and I would have no hope. He, we are the Israelites running away from Goliath, and he is David with one sure throw of the stone topples the giant of sin and death and hell itself. We have, that ought to bring us peace in all circumstances. Romans chapter 8 verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That sounds pretty grim. But no, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Does that not bring you peace? Does it not bring you hope? Whether you get bad news from the doctor, whether you're unsat, and hear me, whether you're unsatisfied or otherwise with the upcoming election, we can chuckle and laugh. I'm serious. Who is in control? God. Christ has achieved victory and he loves you. And he will not let anything separate you from the great, deep, eternal love that he has for you. As we continue in worship, would you please take a moment to go to the Lord in prayer and to thank him for his faithfulness and to ask that he help you trust him more. Father, we thank you so much for the great love that you have for us in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you that you did not leave us dead and dying in our sin, but you have 
brought us from death into life. And that we are the, the weary and wounded sinners that belong underneath the banner of Christ. We were strangers who have been brought into his refuge. And he makes wanderers more than conquerors because they are people of the King of kings and Lord of lords who has reigned before time began and will reign when the time clock stops ticking. So Father, help us as we continue to worship, not only in this service, but with our lives. Help us to remember that Christ is king and he reigns and is victorious. We thank you for Christ. It's in his name and through his blood, all of God's people pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us? Peace like a river. In peace like a
just our voices. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The reason it can be well with our souls is because Christ is our sure and steady anchor. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed while the tempest rages on christ the sure and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night is deeper still deeper still then goes the anchor though i justly stand accused i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be floods of unbelief Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief hopeless somehow oh my soul now lift your eyes to Calvary this my ballast of assurance see his love for ever proved I will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be praise the Lord and as we face the wave of death Christ the sure and steady anchor as we Christ the shore, Christ the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Just our voices. We will hold Praise the Lord for his faithfulness. Father, as we face the wave of death, we know that no matter what comes our way, even, Father, on that final, our final day, as we draw our final breath, what a peace, what a hope that we will cross that great horizon 
All the clouds and storms of this life are behind us and our life secure. And the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. Father, help us hold fast to our anchor, Christ. But Father, give us a peace to know that we hold on to this anchor not by our own strength and might, but by the object of our faith, Christ. We will hold fast to the anchor, but even so, it shall never be removed. Thank you for your faithfulness. Father, as we continue in our worship and hear your word preached, by your spirit move in our hearts and our minds and, and help us to understand your word rightly and help our, our brother, our friend, and our pastor, Danny, Preach your word boldly and faithfully and unapologetically. Father, we do not come to hear words of man. We don't, we don't come here for that. We come to hear you speak. So, Father, we ask, speak to us through your word this morning. We thank you for Christ. It's in his name and through his blood that all of God's people pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, it's going to be in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, and I think, wow, Connor, thank you for picking such a song, and uh, how clever to uh, consider Christ to be an anchor, but as with many of these songs, that's not Connor's cleverness nor Bob Coughlin's, but that's the Scriptures. The book of Hebrews says that Christ Jesus is the anchor of our soul. We hold fast to Him, and what a great word picture uh, to think about in this life as the storms rage among us. Well, as we continue through the book of Romans, we have been looking at God's call of justification, where God declares us uh, not by any work or merit of our own, but by His own grace and His own calling, His own righteousness. He declares us righteous in His presence, justifies us. Uh, You may have heard the clever saying with that, just as if I had not sinned. Uh, And of course, that's how He loves us in Christ, as if we had not but also as if we had complete as, as as if we are a total lawbreaker and Christ has paid it all and so we are eternally grateful for Christ's payment for us and so we looked at justification and 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 so Paul being moved by the Holy Spirit to clarify uh, justification and sanctification uh, I still got battery he seeks to do so with the, uh, with the understanding of how we should view our sanctification. And this could possibly go against all you've heard and all you've practiced, but hopefully this will take a lot of pressure off of you. I know it has for me, and uh, this is just a wonderful, wonderful passage we're going to look at. Uh, this is really a passage of preventive theology as opposed to corrective theology. Now, both of them are right and good, and we must adhere to both. When you sin, you better understand the corrective theology. You under, ought to understand 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we sin, that, that, that Christ is faithful and just to cleanse us of all righteousness. And so we, we cling to Him. We, we go to Him like David did in Psalm 51. We cling to our Savior. We, we cling to His promises. We ask God to help us not to be a certain way or not to do or not to say. And, and we must understand that corrective theology or we will wallow in sin and in discouragement. But even better, even better is preventative theology. Have you ever run out of gas? I have not ever run out of gas. I remember my dad tricking me when I was younger because he had two tanks in his truck. And so he said, he said watch this. And the gas tank went from, one, from the full all the way to the empty, and it looked like we were about to run out of gas, but he was just swapping tanks. And, uh, and so it was kind of funny, but uh, have you ever run out of gas? Run out of gas on the side of the road. You ought not do that nowadays, but the, like it gives you the timer. You've got 30 miles. Like right now, my truck says you've got 50 miles to empty, and it's got a little, it, it won't go away. And so when I leave church, I've got to get some gas. And, and so you better watch that, right? Because when you get down to 5 or 10, and some of y'all like to test that. I'm not naming any names, but there's somebody in my family who has said, listen, you can get down to 1, and you can still make it. <laughs> I will not name names. <clears throat> but if you've ever run out of gas, 
and you've done it more than once, there's probably something you should do to prevent that the next time. Now, thankfully, you can call someone, you can walk yourself to the gas station and get some gas. You're going to have to have some gas before you can get, get going again. But even better than the correction would be prevent, preventative theology, preventative gas. And so this right here, I hope to encourage you, I hope this message empowers you to live victoriously, to not have to, uh, to, to I hate to say this because he's ready and available to forgive you and to hear your cries of, Lord, I'm so sorry, I've, I've, I've had a terrible attitude today, I've, I've said this to someone, I need to go make things right, or I've done this, and I'm, I'm not taking away the correctiveness but I, I want you to understand God's will of how you do live. And I say this, not as one who has conquered this. Please hear that. So this is for all of us. But I say this as one to, to, to mitigate that as, as, as much as possible, to live victoriously and how to do so. So this passage, we're only going to look at the first, uh, first 12 verses here. Uh, excuse me, 14 verses here. And uh, we'll look at the rest next week. But there is a lot to grasp and I want to tell you, as a, as a, when I was a new believer, uh, my college pastor at the time was going through the book of Romans. And uh, I had read the Bible, or I'd read Romans before, and, but he showed me some things in Romans 6 that helped correct my theology in Romans 7. And so when you get to Romans 7, when we get there in a few weeks, I want you to remember what we're learning here in chapter 6, because it's going to help you, and it's going to help <clears throat> prevent the enemy from whispering lies about your life in Christ. So, just hang on with me. Chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God, give us instruction. Father, give us uh, correction. God, give us uh, encouragement and passion. God, to live for you, to love you, to trust you. And God, to apply these verses into our life. God, we thank you that this truly is your word. It's not just words of man, but Lord, it truly is the word of God. God, use your word to sanctify us in truth and righteousness. God, let our lives be changed by your word. God, let us be more and more like Christ. God, we commit this time to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So we're looking at what it means to live a victorious life. And we're looking at how we can rightly consider in order to victoriously live. And so as we look at this, there's really three main truths to grasp from this for understanding a holistic view of our baptism, an understanding of these metaphors of slavery and war, and we want to understand the perversions uh, that can come from grace. And we want to understand rightful grace implications from this passage. And so let's look first of all at how we are to view baptism. <clears throat> now when we typically view baptism, we look at the waters of baptism. We, we look at how people are immersed and, and what history shows is that Christians were immersed in water for baptism from the very beginning. <clears throat> That's what the word means. Baptizo means to immerse in water. But I want us to understand that, that that is not the only thing that is going on with a new believer at the point of salvation. They are literally symbolizing something that has taken place in their life. 
So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says that we have been baptized by His Spirit into the body of Christ. And so what that means is, is that there is a spiritual baptism that takes place for new believers from, from the first century until now, where when you are born again, the very act of the Spirit giving birth to your spirit and making you to a new person, to a child of God, at the same time, simultaneously, you are baptized into the body of Christ. Okay? You, are, you are part of the, the, the family of God. Now, you need to be in a local church, a local expression of that universal body. But you are in, that's why you want to be in church, hopefully, when you are saved. I, I mean, test, experience and testimony does not verify truth, but it sure helps you understand it if it's your own personal deal. And I know for me personally, I did not want to be with God's people as an unbeliever. I felt like I didn't, I didn't belong. I didn't want to be with those kind of people. I didn't want to pursue the Bible and truth and right. I didn't want that. But when Christ saved me, I, I knew the church wasn't perfect, but I wanted to be a part of the church. I wanted to, to understand people that had been walking with God for years. I wanted to understand life from their perspective and how they understood God. And I, wanted to, I, knew, I knew it was people like me that were in need of help, and I wanted to eventually be able to help others in the body of Christ too. And so I wanted to be with the body of Christ. And so I was baptized into the body of Christ. But the Bible says right here, not only are we baptized into the likeness of, of, Christ, of the body of Christ, but we're also baptized and we're identifying with His death. What does it say in verse 3? Verse 3 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? What does that mean? For a believer... You are to identify with the death of Christ. The physical, literal death of Christ. That's, that's what baptism pictures. It pictures you going into a watery grave. And you must consider your life as such. Please do not miss that. Your old life, your old person, your own old values, ambitions, attitudes, Christ buried that in the grave. It was nailed to the cross. It was buried with Christ. You are to reckon it as such, is what the Bible says to do. If you want to walk in victory, you're going to do that. You're going to be, recognize you've been baptized into His death. Now, that sounds terrible. As a matter of fact, when you, when you read some of Jesus' calls of following Him, He says, if any man wants to follow Me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross. He's not talking about putting a little cross on your chain. He's talking about a literal crucifixion. He, he must crucify himself. Who wants to save his life is going to lose it, he says. But if you'll lose your life for my name's sake, for the gospel, you will find life, is what he says. So it's not just that I'm identifying with his death. It's identifying with his death so that you can also identify with his resurrected life. Don't miss that. We identify with his death, we identify his life. So as Christ lives... We live towards God. What does it say in verse 4? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. He's not talking about our personal resurrections. He's talking about being born again in Christ and therefore being able to walk in a new life. So well, everything's still the same. I still have the same family. I still have the same job, same school, whatnot. That, that might be true. But there should be a newness of life. It's Christ's life in you living towards God. That is the newness of life. So this takes place. So we're not to... Listen, it doesn't say that we are to be thinking of ourselves and, and trying to become dead to sin. Don't miss this, okay? This is the, this is the crux of the whole passage. It's not that we're going to try to start doing this better. Do you see that? That is not how you walk in victory and trying to do better at this. Let that sit, sit with you for a second. It's not in that. It is this, collect, this reckoning and this considering. It's considering yourself dead right now that you walk in victory, that you walk in newness of life. Not trying. Just, I am dead. I, Paul says in Galatians 2.20, for I am crucified in Christ. Not I will be. I'm getting better. I'm going to eventually get there. No. I am crucified in Christ. 
And I no longer live, or live for myself is what he means. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the, the faith that Christ had, the understanding of, of his relationship with the Father. That's the faith that lives in us. I know I'm wholly accepted and loved by the Father. I know he's paid for my sins and justified me, declared me righteous apart from my own. I, I, that's who I am. I don't deserve it, but that's what God says. That's what God says. He says, I'm a child of God if I believe. For all those who believe, I believe. It's a declaration. It's not a trying. What do you consider yourself? Because we live in a, in a Christian society of trying better rather than considering self dead and crucified. But that's what he says to do. Now, verse 6, he says this, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Now, when he says, we often talk about there, our old man and our new man and our, well, my old self is, is cropping up and things like that. But what he's talking about, is, and it's not just talking about like an old person, okay? It's as old as in obsolete, not useful anymore. This is, so there's two words for old in the New Testament. One is archaic, where we get archaeology, you study of old things. And that's not the word he uses here. So that's something that's old in antiquity, and that it's, it's in the timeline of history, it's old. But that's not what he's talking about. The word here is to be old as in something that's not used anymore. It would be like if, if, you know, if, if this pew did not work and we needed a new pew, we might put that on the outside, give it away, whatever. It would just be obsolete. Now, in relative time, it's not that old. It's not that old. Maybe your computer. Maybe you've had a computer for 10 years. And it, it's got, you know, if you've got a PC, it's got the bugs and malware and all that kind of stuff, viruses. I'm just joking. For people that are not that techie like me, you have to use Apple, right? But, but once it's like 10 years old, if you're not techie, then that thing is going to become obsolete because you can't get all the, you know, it just doesn't work as fast. But it's old as in it, it's not as efficient. It doesn't serve its purpose like something new would. But it, I mean, old, it's not that old. I mean, you, you probably have lived longer than that old computer, right? And so it's not that old. So he's talking about old as in it's obsolete, it's not useful anymore. You're, the old person who you used to be is not useful whatsoever. Not useful for yourself, others, God. It is obsolete. And so he says, consider it as such. Now Paul adds to this view of death to life by giving us two metaphors to understand the spiritual reality. Okay, There's two metaphors. One is of slavery and the other one is of war. Okay, so he says this, uh, he says in, in verse 1 and 2, he says, don't be ignorant regarding your freedom. Don't be ignorant. Um, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? No. No, 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 no. D don't, don't pervert what he says in chapter 5 about how much more so has grace increased or how much more so has life become rather than death. Don't, don't be confused, he says, and don't, don't pervert that uh, because I give, he gives us a new sense of freedom and that is that we're no longer a slave. Verse 6, knowing this, our old self was crucified with him in order that our old body of sin might be done away with so that we no longer be slaves to sin. So we used to be a slave to sin is what he says. You're no longer a slave to sin. You've been set free. And so recognize this. Recognize this. It was in, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, but it wasn't until December 6th of 1865 that it was actually ratified. The 13th Amendment was ratified on that day where it could be illegal to own people for yourself. And so there, there's a day of slavery, but then there's a day of being set free. Now, just because you were set free did, did not mean you understood what it meant to be set free. Because slavery is all you've ever known if you're a slave to sin, if you're a slave in 1860, uh, in 1850, 1840. That's all you've known. And so those tendencies definitely crop up. You tend to respond to life uh, the way you were raised. You know, there's two things in counseling, and that one of them is how were you raised, and how do those patterns of being raised affect you today? Because you saw things over and over, you heard things over and over again. Between your, your parents, your, your, your friends, your teammates, your classmates, your teachers, principals, all those things, all those things affect you because when this happens, this happens. This happens, cause and effect, cause and effect. What was your religious upbringing? Well, we believe this. 
And because we believe this, we did this, or we thought this. And so these things can correlate back and forth. This is what you've been set free from, though. Okay, you've been set free. Now you must take on your own responsibility to have your mind renewed by the Word of God. Okay, the, the, so you're not a blank slate because you have all that past teachings in your mind. Therefore, it is, you must sense that desire from God to learn how to correct those things you were raised or you thought growing up. And not, not, not just raised, it could be the music you listen to, the movies you watch. Just the thinking of the day, that, that is ingrained in you. But you've been redeemed from that. You've been set free. You're no longer enslaved to that anymore. You must see yourself as that. Don't be ignorant though. You've been set free. Neither sin nor death are your masters. And this is the reason why. Because you're in Christ. Look at what it says in verse 8. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with Him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. Even so, isn't that wonderful? He's not just giving you a, a wonderful proclamation of who Christ is and what He's done. He's tying this into your own life. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is who you are. It will never work to go back to the old man. It will never work. As a matter of fact, let me share with you something I learned in preparation for this, that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be gross at first. Okay, But... If it will have the effect on you that it's had on me, I don't care about grossing you out. <clears throat> one, of the ways, one of the ways that the Romans punished criminals, especially those who committed murder, was the way that they killed them was, so the crucifix was bad enough, right? I mean, they, they made sport of, of brutality. They made sport of violence and, and just the, the most gruesome things you can imagine. They made sport of that, okay? So we think of a little pretty cross, but it was not pretty, right? That would be so gross to just have to sit and watch someone literally die on a cross. It would be, it would be rated R time, you know, times infinity. It would be gross. But another way that they would punish criminals is that if they killed someone, their punishment would be to strap a dead corpse onto their backs and listen, and they would carry around that corpse until they died. And the, the, the chemicals, the poison that would emit from the dead corpse would be so, soaked up into the, the criminal's body as he carried that person around. And that would eventually kill him. I know it's terrible. But scholars say that this could be what Paul is alluding to. The old man is a dead corpse of a body. How foolish are we to go back to being alive towards sin and dead towards God rather than dead towards that. Get that body, get that dead man off of me. Because we have been set free to live for God. Don't go back to the dead man. Don't put him back on your body. It's gross to think about. But maybe that's the point that God gives Paul to write this. It is, if you think that's gross, what does God think when He watches us? Go back to a, an old way of thinking, an old way of living. But we ought not be ignorant regarding our freedom. Neither sin nor death are our masters. And next, we have a new war with a new general. Colossians chapter 1 says that we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and have been transferred into the kingdom of the Son. And so we have a new general, and we are, we've always been in a war, but the war is new because we're on the different side. Okay, we are not, we, we do not promote evil, though maybe we once did. Our lives promoted it. We don't, we don't propagate it. We're on the, we're on the other side. We're on, the, on Christ's side of righteousness. And He will always reign. But sometimes it's kind of confusing. But what does He say here? Verse, verse 13 says this, <clears throat> Do not go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of righteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now that word instruments there can be translated instruments, vessels, or weapons. And 
Several scholars say that what Paul is alluding to is the fact that you're in a war, and those weapons of that war, of, your, of the warfare, must be towards God, must be in favor with God, must be on His side. And therefore, present your, the, body, your, the members of your body, your mind, your soul, your, 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 your limbs, everything about you needs to be dedicated and devoted to your new general who has purchased you and plucked you out of the enemy's hands. Imagine fighting in a losing war knowing that the side that you're fighting for has a losing cause as well, an evil cause. I, would, I mean, I hate to be in war, but even worse, to be in war fighting for something or someone that I disagree with. And so that's what Christ does. He picks you up out of that war and puts you on the right side. And so therefore, don't be fighting against the one who bought you and puts you on the, on the winning side. Paul is making his point. Consider yourselves dead to sin. Your members of your body, your mind, your, your, what, you, what you look at, what you hear, what you participate in. Make it be a part of what is going to eternally last. Fight the good fight. Fight the war. We have a new general. And Christ is worthy of our, of our fight. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, fight the good. I have fought the good fight. It is a good fight, but it is a fight. It is a battle. Because you still have the world and all the ways of the world. You have the enemy's whispers that says, keep using your life for anything but God. Anything but God. There's a lot of neutral things you can do, right? Do those neutral things and just don't think about, don't talk about God. That's the enemy's way. When the Lord's way is whatever you do, whatever, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Because we have a new general, a new master. We have, we have a passion in our soul for his glory now. And we do it for him. Now we've been gifted with this freedom. And this change from a losing side to a winning side. But this grace that God's given us should not, ought not be perverted or misunderstood. Do not pervert the grace of God. Do not think, well, so God is about showing his grace so therefore, the more I sin, the more He's going to show His grace and His mercy and His forgiveness. Wow, what a great logic is that what God really wants me to do is sin. No, by no means. What does He say? Verse 1, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace can increase? Is God just wanting to do that? No, may it never be. If you died to that, why, why still live in it? Don't, do not pervert that. As a matter of fact, God rescues us from from sin, God rescues us by His grace, whereas the, uh, uh, the law once mastered us, kept us down. We, we saw that last week that, that the law caused sin to increase. But grace rescues us, and the law masters. But grace rescues us out of that. And so it doesn't mean we, have, uh, we don't look at the law, we don't consider the Ten Commandments. It's not that. It's that we don't, we don't live there and we don't, we, don't, we don't push it aside. Jesus said that not one jot or tittle will be thrown away from the law. But we are always considering the one who kept the law on our behalf. And in Christ, in Christ, you can please God with whatever temptation against the law you have. It doesn't guarantee that you will never sin, but it's in considering who you are in Christ. Again, this is not about trying harder. But it is about a responsibility. So we're always trying to balance the, the sovereignty of God of what He says, what He does, what He says He will do. But we never nullify our responsibility to carry out what He's commanded us to do. And that commanding, though, is not just a sitting and thinking, I will get this right. I am determined today. I will show God that I will get this right. That is not going to get it. You will not show God. You will fail. Your victory is only in considering who Christ is. That you are dead in your sins and you died to sin because when Christ died on the cross, my death was put there as well. So that's why there's no sting in death now. Because He has taken on my death. He's taken on the sting of death. So the, so the death is only a passing. That's when we say, well, we, we kind of use that loosely. Well, someone's going passed away. That's... It's comforting, but like don't, don't let the repetition of that phrasing 
numb you to what really happened. That, that is true for believers. It literally is a passing. There's no sting. It's simply a corridor. It's like going through that door back there. It's a, it's a passing through the door. Because Christ has taken that sting of death. He's taken our death. And, but, but my gosh, because of that, we don't want to live enslaved to sin any longer. How can we who've been set free and have been promised such an incredible eternity go back and live how we used to live? We cannot. We don't want to do that. And so Paul is trying to make that clear in this passage. We don't, we don't pervert the grace of God and say, well, God just wants us to continue to sin. No, no, no. We take the grace of God and we give thanks to God for that. And we consider ourselves, because of His grace, to be done with that way of life. Consider it. it when, you, when he says consider it, it means to live off of what that statement is. It would be like if someone told you, a faithful person, said, listen, I have put, put $10,000 in your account. Now, you need a new car, go buy, go, go buy that car you need. And you go to the car lot and you talk to them and say, well, I, I was told I, could get a, I need a new car and, uh, and I'm, I'm banking on there being enough money in that account. <laughs> but, and there is. And so you go and you pay for the car because it's been put there. The money's there. So you've considered it there, which caused you to go and buy the car. Now, if it wasn't, money wasn't there, yeah, it'd come back and you went, no car, right? But that's the thing is, you can't see these things take place. You can't spiritually see the grace of God that God promises this is who you are and this is what He's done, but you must believe it. You believe these things. You believe you have a full acquittal in Christ. And we live that truth on a daily basis with great joy and gratitude to God. We, we operate out of that spending account. You see, because the debt has been paid and He's put righteousness in that account. And so he's not asking you to feel better, feel like it's true. He's saying that this is true. Period. That's good news for life. That will get you through a lot of bad days. The, 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 the facts of the gospel that you consider to be true, you reckon it true. You go and spend off of that truth, whether you feel like it or not. Now, if you think this is cheap grace, you just go and try that sinning so that grace can abound, and the Lord will spank your backside just like He does the rest of us. <clears throat> but the thing is, once, when you become grateful for this great love and forgiveness, you don't want to, to sin against Him. You know Him. You walk with Him. You spend time in His Word, and, and you, you read who He is. And you thank God, God, thank you. Thank you that you have done this. Thank you that you say these things. I, I just love doing this with my Sunday school class. We just go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. What's it saying about God? We write those things down. And then at the end of the, the, the time we have together, we just go through and pray. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is a simple thing. And I know it's so simple. It's so simple that you don't even need Lifeway for it, right? It's so simple you can transfer that practice around the world people can do that in countries all over you can simply read talk about it think about the think about that passage which in the whole gospel message of the bible and see the relevance of the passage we're looking at here in romans in, in the midst of all that god has said and what god's done from the beginning and what he promises to do at the end again we're not there at the end yet right but it doesn't mean you have to live with your feet shackled and your heart shackled and doubt and discouragement from the enemy's lies between now and then. We don't have to do that. We have the great privilege of grace and freedom to live as if these things are true simply because they are. Our question is, do we continue to believe this? As a matter of fact, this word consider uh, that he says, even so, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. This is a, it's an ongoing present tense. It's not something we just do once. Each day you are to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. That is God's will for our life. All the details of God's will, we don't know that. But I'll tell you one thing, you do this, you'll figure out all the rest. You can just look back and see God doing all the rest. This is the great privilege of the Christian life. And it's a great joy to preach this. Like, it's, like, I mean, it's like telling somebody how awesome your, you know, your dad is 
And uh, you're not him, right? But, but you're, you know, you're a little kid. You're telling your dad's better than my dad type of thing, right? I'm not trying to, but I'm telling you, if, if your dad, John 8, is not the father, but is the devil the father of all lies, our dad is better. Our heavenly father is better. And our old father is not worthy to be lived for. He is the father of all lies. He deceives. He destroys. He kills. But this father is worth living for. And it's such a joy to declare His praises, His goodness on our behalf. This is our God. It's a church, our family. This is our God. If you're here today and you don't know God, you've never heard this grace that you can't earn or deserve, I tell you, the story of the Bible is that man is incomplete. After man fell in the garden, sinned against God, he no longer had the ability to glorify God on his own. He needs God. God had a, a substitute for man in the garden. He killed an animal. They tried to clothe themselves in fig leaves, and God said, no, that's not good enough. I'll we'll kill an animal and clothe you with animal skins to show you that there must be death on behalf of guilty sinners. And so God did that. God proves His points all throughout Genesis and Exodus, taking families that were unheard of, taking, taking uh, scenarios that were impossibilities, and God working through all those situations until you get to the very last chapter of Genesis. And, and the conclusion is, all these people have intended lots of things for evil, but God's intended it for good. And you see God's goodness. So with each chapter of the Bible, you see man in great difficulty. He cannot find his way. He cannot make a way himself. But you see God stepping in and rescuing him. You see God doing that with Moses. You see God doing that with Joshua. You see that with all the judges. Man sins against God. He cries out to God. God provides a redeemer, a rescuer, a judge, a savior. And then out of their... Their, their dullness of thinking, they sin against God, God rebukes them, God oppresses them again, they go through this continual cycle, that God gives them kings, they have terrible kings, they have good kings, but they need the Lord in all of it, and they see that with every earthly king, he's not enough, that there's got to be a better king out there, so all the kings fail, God uh, is true to his promise that he will put them in captivity, he, even his own people, he enslaves them to Babylon, to Assyria, until the time of their captivity is over with. Then they go into great legalism. They, they add to God's law. The Pharisees add to the law. They say, we're not going to go back to idolatry. They don't go back to idolatry, but instead they go the opposite way, and they create these man-made laws that just enslaves everybody because nobody can feel free until the perfect king comes. And that king did what neither Adam nor Moses nor Joshua nor none, any of the prophets could do. He always spoke the truth he always interceded for people. He always stepped in the place of people. He was a perfect prophet. He was a perfect king. They, nailed, they actually nailed the placard, said king of kings, as a mockery, but it, they nailed the truth there because he truly was and is the king that encompasses and puts to shame all other kings. He lived and he died in the place of sinners. And people mocked him and said, no, it can't be. We're looking for a better king. But the Father proved that it was a perfect sacrifice, that He truly was dying in the place of sinners by physically raising Him from the dead, something we do not see today. He raised Him from the dead so much so that people for 40 days saw the, the risen Jesus. They saw Him. They talked to Him. And they were, it was unmistakable. So the whole world changed, and the church started and proliferated. And that's where we are here today. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know Christ and you want to, Today's your day. If you are sick of your sin, and you are, are, I am so sick of being enslaved to my sin, surely there's a better way. We say God's brought you here today for a wonderful reason. It's to save your soul, to give you life, to make it where you're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer on the enemy's team. You're no longer losing. But you're here today to be saved. You're here to be saved from God's perfect just wrath that you and I deserve. And you must respond, though. You must surrender. You must throw up your white flag and say, Lord, what must I do? What should I do? How do I, how do I go forward? And in your brokenness and your honesty and in your willingness to follow Christ, the Bible says He promises He will save those. Those who call out to Him in truth, He will save you. As a matter of fact, what will happen is your spirit has been dead to God all this, all this time will be born again. It will be made alive towards God. And it won't be from you, it'll be of God. 
and you will have his life dwelling in you. And it will change everything. It will change your desires, your motivations, your attitude, your ambitions. Change it all. Maybe God has you here today for that. If he does, we would love to talk to you more. Not a single person in this room was born a Christian. Every single one that's a Christian was drawn to God by God for his glory. And they too had recognized their sinfulness. They had recognized they needed a Savior. And they had to cry out and say, oh Lord, help. So just know you're not alone if that's you. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the risen Lord, <clears throat> that your word stands true. Lord, we thank you that you draw sinners to yourself for the glory of your name. And God, you promise you will turn away no one who calls out to you. God, we thank you, God, that um, Lord, all those who seek you find you. And then later find that, they, the, the, that the seeking came from you, that the drawing and the pulling came from you. God, we just thank you so much for your good grace, for your good mercy. Oh, thank you so much for putting people in my path that share the gospel with me. And not just share, I thank you for those who live the gospel in spite of my antagonism against it. God, thank you so much for your grace, your wonderful grace. God, thank you for your steadfast patience and forbearance with sinners. And God, we just thank you so much for these declarations that we see from your word that doesn't say become sinless. It doesn't, it doesn't say to become perfect. It says to consider ourselves in Christ who is the perfect one and to find our victory there. Father, help each person in this room today to walk in this great love and victory. God, finding correction and finding repentance and asking for forgiveness when, when there is sin and never denying that. But Lord, I pray that we could walk in victory with a lot more, lot more days of victory than, than defeat. Oh Lord, help us to do that, to glorify your great name. Thank you. Pray us all in Christ's name. Amen.